Beginning when I was nine, all the way through college, I ran with a baton in my hand. I had quick twitch muscles that gave me the ability and gift to run on teams in what is an otherwise individual sport of track. I ran on many, many teams of the four by 100 meter dash. I often began the race with the baton in my hand, clenched tightly as I knelt, crouched into the blocks. I would shoot out and hug the corner until I could pass it off to my teammate. There I would rest, catch my breath, and watch the baton go from one teammate to another to another until it crossed the finish line. It was elating to see that and extra disappointing when we all heard what seemed like the largest echo out there if the baton hit the ground, disappointingly. But either way, it always happened that I could only be a part of the excitement, win or lose, if I gave my baton away. Now my baton has morphed into a pencil where I trace letters that Lydia gets to copy. It's morphed into a box of dirt and a shovel that I've started cultivating a garden in, but Spencer wants a part of it, and he is all in it. It's morphed into a ring on my left hand that reminds me of my um, role to show up, to live with vulnerability and love, and to offer space to receive that love back from my partner. Whatever role we play, whatever batons that we carry for a while, we are then asked to pass them on. And just like the team of runners, the passing on part is, the, is part of the whole experience and it encourages continued support. It's not an excuse to quit, to walk off the track and get a snack by yourself, to feel sorry for yourself that all eyes have shifted to a, a different runner, or to be worried or annoyed by how someone else carries the baton when it's out of your grip. The baton is the gift, and we are entrusted enough to share it. God said to Abraham, you are blessed to be a blessing. What a statement of confidence and responsibility. On this day when we remember those who have nurtured us, who have nurtured our stories, we would be wise to see the batons that we carry from others. Perhaps it's the ability to play a musical instrument uh, more than a record player. Or it's the delight that you have in climbing a mountain. Perhaps it's the characteristics and qualities of flexibility or patience, anal analytics or curiosity. Perhaps it's the attribute that is unique to you in the way that you relate with others. It's likely that these batons were passed along and that those who gave them to you encourage you to hold on and finish strong with them in hand. We can acknowledge the baton, the story, the meaning that has transformed us. We can recognize the baton giver as a fan, a companion, a person who prods us when, our, when we're down, lifts us when we're in difficult spots, and offers us a tender place to land when we're tired and hungry or elated. The cultivated relationship on giving and receiving, endows the baton, that which is passed on and carried to the end, its value, its preciousness, and its purpose. When we acknowledge this deep truth, we begin to recognize that our own ability and purpose in being the same to another, another person or creation, is that of a baton carrier and baton giver to be the one who passes on the baton from generation to generation is the gift that we have. Terry Bivens has received the baton graciously and continues to seek ways to pass it through her story of faith and communion with God. Good morning. Thank you, Pastor Sarah. Um, Again, my name is Terry Bivens, and I am Betty Lowell's uh, oldest daughter. 
and I live in southern Indiana, but I've been here in uh, Stevensville, where I grew up, for the past year, so I could be close to my mom. And when I talked to Pastor Sarah about being a mentor or having a mentor or a role model, then four people come to mind immediately. First of all, my grandparents on my mother's side, um, and then Evadne McKinley, who most of you know or knew, and uh, my mother. My grandparents uh, immigrated here from Russia. They were Germans from Russia, and they immigrated with their families when they were children. My grandmother was eight, and my grandfather was 13, and they went to Kansas, uh, where they met and got married. But um, my grandmother's name was Amalia, so her nickname was Molly, and my, and my grandfather's was Christian. And uh, my, I can hear my grandmother saying, Christ, Christ, she always called him. And it was, it was great. But one of my earliest memories of my grandmother was when I was about four years old. I uh, remember sitting on her lap. She was sitting in a rocking chair by the door, and she was teaching me the Lord's Prayer. So we went over, rocking back and forth, over and over, until I learned it. And I was so excited that, that I had learned the, the, the Lord's Prayer. And memories of my grandfather was he was a great gardener. He had um, a wonderful, wonderful vegetable garden. And he loved to fish. I inherited the love for the garden, but not the fishing. And, uh, it, and, and my memories of him are just wonderful, but he outlived my grandmother by about 10 years. And when my husband and I and my son came out here to visit one year, uh, he was living in a trailer beside my mom and dad's house, and I went over to visit him, and he's sitting at the kitchen table, and he's reading his Bible. And we got to talking about that, that he read his Bible every day and felt that it was a great comfort to him after being alone for so long. And Yvette McKinley, she was, just, she was just a great mentor. She was my junior high teacher, my 4-H leader, my Sunday school teacher, and, and all of those things, and great friends with my, with my family. And then my mother, of course. My mother was the oldest of two. I'm the oldest of three. And she has uh, always been a people person. She says, I just love people. I just love people. And she has great leadership qualities. All the years that I was growing up, she belonged to the American Legion Auxiliary, and she held every office in the church. It was very important to her, and the Garden Club, and uh, she was the president of the Senior Center for t over 10 years. And now that she's in a retirement home in the Living Center, she slowed down a little bit, but she still loves people. And um, she came out to visit one of my memories of mother was when she came out to Indiana, southern Indiana, to visit us. My son was about seven or eight years old, and we're driving down the, down the street. And um, I was driving. She was sitting beside me, and I remember my son leaning over the seat and said, Grandma Betty, if Jesus sits on the right hand of God, who sits on the left? And she, without hesitation, she just turned around. She says, well, Eric, the Holy Spirit. And so that was, a, that was a great memory. She, she could do anything. And, you know, I thought anything she could do, I could do. I can't do it better, but anything she could do, I could do. And when I uh, graduated from high school, I went to airline school and then got a job with Air Canada in Chicago in, out at the airport, O'Hare Airport, and got an apartment. And she wanted me to stay connected to God, stay connected to the church, so she, she sent me the upper room. And it was every month, like clockwork, she'd send it. And I read it, and I still read it even today. Um, but probably a good memory of her, and it's not even a memory, it's, it's something that she does. She starts every day looking at St. Mary's Mountain and singing, this is the day the Lord has made. And she sings that every morning. And this past year, I have been able to be in several Bible studies with her. And when there's a lull in the conversation, then she'll start singing. And then everybody stops and sings along. So she has, she has great faith. And I appreciate that in her. And um, she will always be, you know, a mentor. But thinking about myself as a mentor 
or as uh, somebody to look up to. I th I th first thing that comes to my mind is my three grandchildren. Maddie, Joe, and Lily. Maddie's 23 now, uh, Joe's 19, I mean, he's 21, and Lily's 19. And my daughter-in-law, Teresa Bivens, is um, from a great big, large Catholic family. So my grandchildren went to Catholic school, and Maddie, when she was in uh, probably the eighth grade, called me on the phone one day, and she said, Grandma, Grandma, I need to interview you. And I said, okay. She says, well, we have an assignment at school, and uh, I have to write a report. I have to write a report about uh, someone with a strong Christian faith in my family, and I choose you. Mm -hmm. Oh, that, that just made me feel wonderful. I was, mm -hmm. I was thrilled to death that, that she did that. So I pray that I've been a good role model for my, for my grandchildren. And one of the last things that I really feel a part of is I was a short-term missionary, still am, but um, I work for uh, a ministry out of southern Indiana that um, the, the um, president, Devon McGuire, invented a water purifier for rural communities to make safe drinking water using just common table salt and a 12-volt battery, and it would purify water. So my, it was my job to train people wherever I was sent around the world. And one of the um, times I remember, I was in Zambia. I went to Zambia for about, every year for about 10 years, led mission teams over there, but um, got to train on the purifier. We're out in the village. We'd installed a purifier there, one of the villages, St. Soa Village. We'd restored, in installed a purifier. And then when I'd go back every year, we'd have a community meeting and I'd hear all these testimonies and how the water purifier was keeping their kids from having diarrhea all the time and they could go to school and they didn't have to go so far to get safe drinking water. Well, about the third year or fourth year after being in this village, a lady stood up and she says, um, Miss Terry, I want to tell you that, that when we sit and wait for the water to be purified, which is about an hour, then the chlorine has to mix with the water and kill all the bacteria, it takes about an hour. She says, now we sit and talk about Jesus. And I thought, oh, Grace, that's fantastic. <laughs> you know, finally, they're getting the connection between safe drinking water and the living water. Mm -hmm. And that was so exciting for me to be just a part of that, just to, just to encourage them to have women's groups and have Bible studies. And when I'd go to each one of the communities, each one of the villages, the women were so proud. They'd sit around on rocks and they'd get their Bibles out and we'd talk about Jesus. So I hope that I've had some sort of a, um, an impact uh, just, to, just to sow some seeds around. But anyway, that's my story. Thank you, Miss Sarah. Thank you, Miss Terry. Thank you, thank you. As our scripture from Deuteronomy tells us, we have a gift of the Holy Scripture, of the gospel, of the good news that we are asked to pass from generation to generation to generation. Richard Rohr says, we do not finally have it until we hand it on to others. May you experience God's grace and peace and courage today and that it may give you the desire to pass it on. Be, God be with you. Amen.